Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to another edition of Monday Morning Podcast. I am your host, Alex Gore. I'm here with Dewan Tran, helmed by uh, founder Grant C. Kirkpatrick and Dewan, KAA Design out of LA leads their clients through meticulous planning on how to incorporate the existing nature around the house, its unique site locations within a city, cliffside, beachfront, or others to create a bio relationship between the house, its owner, and the surrounding nature. As a partner of the firm, uh, his vision and leadership extends to both the management and project design. His focus on firm-wide initiatives relating to its organizational growth, business development, and long-term strategic planning guides the firm ability to leverage over 30 years of history and nimbleness required to retrain retain its position on the front lines of an ever-changing industry and client clientele. Welcome inside the firm. Great. Thanks, Alex. Hey, I guess um, I want to, before we go into your past or anything, yeah. one of my biggest questions, and if you don't have an immediate answer, maybe, maybe you'll think <laughs> about it, but what in either management, you know, strategic planning, business development has made the biggest impact on the bottom line of your firm over the lifespan that you've been there? Oh boy, that's that's a great question, right? Uh, you know, it, it's funny when you, you think about it in, in those terms and and uh, I can't say I've never been asked that question that way, but I, I would say, listen, you know, when we think about the how we manage and how we design, the management portion of it is is how we structure our design process, right? It's kind of the, the recipe. I mean, you know, we can all, anybody can kind of design and create a vision and execute something kind of in a vacuum, but kind of the, the bumpers that we put on our design process and where we allow ourselves to really go to really push the design and or pull back to, you know, maybe prioritize client goals or budget and other things is, is a critical key element of what we do, especially within the, the custom high end residential business over these last 30 plus years. And, and I would say if there was one thing over the, the history of the firm that we're, that we've been exceptional at. Um, it's been a double-edged sword is that we've been extremely flexible and nimble. Um, the firm in many ways has morphed and evolved over 30 years. You know, it started off uh, originally with my business partner, Grant, who founded it 30 plus years ago in, in 88. And uh, it grew from around 20 to 30 people all the way up to 100 people where we wow. had, uh, you know, aside from an architecture team, uh, we did product design, we did landscape architecture, we did interiors. Um, and there was probably a few other things thrown in there as well. Um, and there was this kind of arc to the firm, um, but all along the way it was about creating a, a firm structure and a management workflow that would allow us to kind of be flexible and nimble to whatever the needs of our core demographic community are, which were end user clients. And, uh, and I would say that's probably been the biggest thing. You know, a lot of firms I, I think get challenged by that because they kind of lock in on who they are very early on. And so there's, there's kind of a less of an opportunity to evolve. Um, but being flexible and nimble has been key. And I, and I would say even more so, I'm sure for so many of us in the last two to three years with COVID, it's kind of turned the world upside down. So, yeah. So some people might think, you know, you mentioned you went up to a hundred. Yeah. Sometimes firms go up and I've actually talked to different firms and they've, and they've come back down and yeah. people might perceive that as a failure, but I, I don't. The reason right. why is because you might overextend. You might not be giving your clientele what you need to be doing. You might not actually, let's say you were making more money or whoever, the ownership group, but is it worth it if it's too much management, too much headache, all this other stuff? So have you kept at that hundred and did you come back down and did you come back down because of many of those reasons or was it the recession in 08 or yeah. something else? It, it was all of that. It, it's really a great observation. It's funny. I just had this conversation with a with a colleague of mine yesterday. Um, but you know, we were at a hundred about ten years ago. It was right before the recession. You know, where we all kind of got hit. And you know, at that point in time, we scaled back for economic reasons. You know, so we we started to shed different parts of our business, which 
weren't really core to who we were, you know, as architects and landscape architects. Um, so we shed our interiors team, we shed a few other things, a rendering team, we, we kind of pulled back a little bit on the product design aspect of it. These things were great, you know, around 2007, 2010, as far as supplemental disciplines that contributed to the kind of work and the process that we did. But we realized that, you know, when came, push come to shove, especially through the economy, we just needed to focus back on basics. And what that's done is it's really kind of set into motion over the last 10 to 15 years. And I would say primarily even more so in the last five years, uh, a, a renewed focus on what is it that we're really great at. And it, a little bit of it's the maturity of a firm, having gone through that process and that arc of building up and becoming 100 people and, and doing a lot of different things in a lot of different ways and getting to that point where you, you understand who you are as a firm now after 20, 25 years and really focusing primarily on the high-end residential without necessarily feeling that you needed to take on interiors and product design and a few other ones because we developed such a network and collaborative community with, with a lot of other people in that particular arena. So we're down to about 35 or 40 people now. It's kind of our sweet spot. It's where we've been for the last, I would say three to four years. And I, I anticipate us kind of staying in that arena um, and be able to continue to do the kind of work that we do. It's, it's big enough to be able to take on larger scale ventures. Um, at the same time, it's not so unwieldy, at least at this point in time, especially from an HR uh, management component where it feels like we're running, we're trying to run a, a big corporation. So it's kind of the best of both worlds for us. And it's weird too, it's all relative because to a one or three person firm, 35 is, is huge. To a right. high 500 person firm, it's small. To yeah. a, a tech company, you know, you're not even a, a department. You're a right. <laughs> you're a small knows? team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're you're a team. Um, right. So keeping on on this train, uh, just because I'm interested, I think our clients are interested. I think business is not always talked about. Oh, and I should say firsthand, we'll get into this later. Your architecture work at your firm is absolutely amazing, stunning, Thank stunning you. work. Um, and Appreciate we'll pull that. up some visuals for some people listening on YouTube and, and probably talk about the process and, and things like that. Um, but going into the nitty gritty, uh, when you are putting out a proposal or a fee, are you percentage of construction based? Are you fixed fee? Are you hourly? Are you something else? <laughs> Good question. So historically, we've been percentage cost of work. Um, that I would say almost exclusively up to about five years ago. Um, and then we started to evolve a bit. I mean, there's different projects that just require a different fee model. And so at this point in time, we actually entertain a handful of fee models. We still entertain cost of work. It's much less than what it was before. But Is that cost of construction, basically? Cost of construction, yeah. yeah. Given the scale and the kind of the unique aspects of so much of our custom homes, it's it's probably the most appropriate, and historically has been the most appropriate vehicle um, to to um, support the value of what we do on those particular projects. Uh, but more recently, and I think this has to do with you know COVID, and it's been kind of a, a wild west of a financial market out there. I mean, cost of construction right now is is beyond challenging. It's hard to manage expectations, even for the the most high profile and well-to-do clients, you know, it's it's that expectation management, especially when it comes to our fees is, is hard because it, that dynamic is something that's, it's hard to, again, just manage. And so we've gravitated more to a dollars per square foot uh, mm. vehicle um, because in many ways it, it, it feels much more transparent. It's much more clear. It's much more rational for somebody to understand that, listen, if we're building a 5,000 square foot home and it becomes a 6,000, we understand why your fee increases by 20%. Right. But it, it's, 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 it's easier to have that conversation and have them feel like they're in control of that because of, you know, their program and whatnot versus we estimated your project to be five million dollars and now it's six million dollars. We actually didn't design anything or do anything differently. It's just the nature of the market says it's 20 percent more. And, and so theoretically, we're entitled to a 20 percent fee adjustment. That's a harder conversation to have. Some clients understand it. Some clients feel that's um, unfair. You know, why you didn't do anything differently. It's just the market renders themselves differently. So mm. so we've, been, in many particular instances, have now transitioned again to a dollar per square foot. And then, of course, we we have hybrid models where we might tier our fee. We have hybrid models where we might do hourly for a particular phase. We'll mix and match and, and kind of create what the, the most... Um, the most appropriate win-win scenario for the for the project is and for the clients to actually feel good and that is a transparent process throughout so do you ever get bit on let's say it's going to be a 5,000 square foot house 
and just throughout the process, it ends up being a 4,000 square foot house. Yeah. Do you ever get bit? Because sometimes it takes just as much to design a 4,000 versus a 5,000. Or is your fee high enough that if it's over a certain limit, I'm going to pretend, um, and if you have this, it'd be great to let yeah. our listeners know, between 1,000 and, and 4,000 is X amount of fee. I'll, I'll make right. up a number. This is not going to sure. be correct. $10, $15 a square foot. Right. Between, what did I say? Four and six is 12 and six and over is 10. Right. So I guess that was a two-part question. Do you ever get bit by them going down or do you have a... Uh, you know, it's it's funny. It's it's We probably have one or two projects in the history of this firm where the clients have actually done less than what they expected. You know, uh, these are so often passion projects and our clients, once they get into the project, they're often more and more excited to do that one other thing. And so it's pretty rare that we would come down at least significantly enough to where we felt like we lost fee um, or at least that we weren't appropriately compensated. Um, so, so we've been fortunate in that. And I think a little bit of that is just given the, the market that we're dealing with, you know, doing custom homes, not necessarily spec homes, but be able to kind of manage and temperature check all along the way to ensure that we're not overextending ourselves or putting the client in an uncomfortable position. Um, but to your other question about tiered fees, uh, yeah, it, it's something that we we go to every once in a while. You know, there's some obviously projects that are, uh, I would say, above and beyond where they're 10, 15, 20,000 square feet, right? And, mm-hmm. and um, we found different opportunities for some of those clients uh, to rationalize that up to 10,000, it's X, up to 20, it's X, and then above and beyond, it might be at cost. Because there is an economy of means once you get to a certain point, right? There's a certain design energy, but then once you get to homes of a certain size, um, a lot of it's back of a house, it's storage, it's the big garage, you know, it's things of that level versus, you know, something that is uh, proportionally complicated. It's not like the kitchen went from X and became twice as big. It's really kind of more so these back of house spaces where, where that value is. And so that's ways, those are ways that we found to further nuance a dollars per square foot fee structure. That again just gives greater clarity, uh, acknowledges the you know the, the uniqueness and the value of, of what we might put into a particular program. Again, kitchens, areas where there's a lot of focus, um, versus you know the client has a, a 20 car garage, doesn't have high expectations. It's just a big space. But why would that you know 2,000 square foot on in terms of fee be equal to a 2,000 square yeah. foot kitchen where there's a lot more bells and whistles going on? So. Yep, that makes sense. Um, and then for billing, do you bill monthly against progress or do you have set deliverables and then chunks? How does that yeah. work? Or obviously it, something different. Yeah, it's both. It, it's uh, it, it's, the, it's those two, which is, um, it's a monthly against the progress. And so oftentimes when we roll out a project, uh, you know, we, again, a lot of what we do is client expectation management. Um, we'll set out a, a process. We'll tell them where all the milestones are in terms of our design milestones, with schematic design, development, construction documents, and permitting go. So they understand the overall framework and the arc of what that first 10 to 12 months often looks like. And then we attribute percentages of completion for each of those. And so that's what we bill against along the way. Um, and oftentimes they do align with a particular milestone like permit submission and or a particular phase closeout. Not all the time, but sometimes they do. So that, that gives us an opportunity all along the way, especially during the early design process, if a client uh, gets distracted or changes their mind, that we can very clearly point out and kind of isolate that and either uh, uh, request an additional service because we've extended our timeline or we, you know, it, it's mutually acknowledged that we're taking a step back here because the clients reconsidered something that they previously approved. So having kind of a monthly rhythm of billing is a very healthy thing, not only in terms of financially running a business, because I think so much of the other cadence of what we do, you know, is on a monthly basis, but it's a, it's a, it's in a, it's a very responsible gut check for the client to realize that we're moving forward, right? We're just not playing in the sandbox for the next 10 months and we can go back to month three if for some reason he doesn't like what he sees in month 10. So there's, there's a, there's a, a, a more, um, responsible and clear way to communicate and manage client expectations all along the way. Do you have, um, not a story, but maybe a, uh, a, a way of handling when clients come to you with crazy ideas and that crazy ideas is code word for 
maybe uh, not so smart ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. You know, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's rare. I, I know this sounds a little silly. I mean, there's clients that definitely have a um, interesting point of view about certain things. I mean, but I think what we've come to realize and, and it's probably a little bit of the beauty of what we get to do with custom homes for actual end user clients is that these are their homes. This is their reality. Right. And, and so, you know, as much as we might first kind of question and, 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 and try to wrap our head around just does that actually work? Why would you want to do something like that? Um, I think we've learned through the years to kind of take a moment of pause and, and really dig into that to really understand, you know, why do you want uh, the bedroom on one floor and the, the the master bathroom on another floor? Isn't that weird to go between two floors in your master suite, for example, right? But there's probably really good reasons for that. And, and part of what I think what we do really well early on is we tease that out, um, especially early on in the design process to ensure that um, those unique things about their lifestyle, you know, in terms of how they currently live or more importantly, what, how they aspire to live um, are captured, right? And so I think we've kind of gotten over the hump of, of um, you know, maybe questioning overly uh, whether or not something is the right move or not. Because at the end of the day, we kind of always say this sometimes when we're pushed up against those walls, it's not our house, it's theirs, you know, and, and in, 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 in large respects, we were really just a vehicle to help them uh, realize that. So, yeah. The, the reason why I ask is because every architect has probably dealt with, with something yeah. like that. And it, the spectrum goes from, I've heard architects literally fire clients, <laughs> which mm. is kind of crazy, um, to, to then kind of messing up, you know, what a beautiful design is to working with them. And, and like you said, understanding and, and morphing that in. Um, yeah. It's just, you have so many amazing projects you seem yeah. to d have done really well with with that well and i'll tell you one story and you were asking for example so there was one particular project that um, that we completed about five years ago and uh you know to a crazy question on his point we were doing an outdoor kitchen and he just had this this epiphany where he wanted a pizza oven and he wanted it in a particular place and as you probably know pizza ovens aren't just quiet appliances that you put in a wall there's flues there's size requirements it's essentially having a fireplace in, you know, in terms of a three-dimensional element that needs to be programmed and accessed. And we were really challenged because the way that this particular outdoor space was coming up, it didn't allow to have a pizza oven in that particular place. Um, but he challenged us and he pushed us on it. And what we came up with, and there's actually a photo on our website, it's of the tree house. Um, and it, it was a beautiful home that we did in Southern California. And we essentially created the outdoor kitchen all around it by creating this two and a half story board form concrete sculpted tower that everything revolved around. It. And it just became this beautiful vertical anchor piece to that entire space. And, and our client actually jokes with us now that, you know, he takes a lot of credit for pushing us because it was something that we would have not naturally have done. Um, and he's right. And, and we look back on it and we chuckle because uh, it allowed us, it pushed us in, a, in an aesthetic direction to, you know, to basically embrace what the client had wanted to do and, and rather than fire him or talk him out of it, we, we tried to figure out how to best make it work and ultimately became one of the more iconic parts of the, of the project that a lot of people speak about. So um, that is awesome. Well, yeah. this is a great segue. I'm going to try to share my screen. Sure. And let's talk about some projects. Um, first, as long as we're going in the nitty gritty, um, mm -hmm. and this one, so, uh, California does this so well, this <laughs> w without basically trim or returns. Yeah. So in the project that we're looking at, it looks basically like storefront on, mm -hmm. uh, the bottom. And then on the top, uh, this is a glass wall sitting on concrete and then a roof assembly. Right. Is all your your spacing and your place for shims all on the top and then covered by that board coming in or? Pretty much. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's pretty amazing nowadays. You know, the the door and window system um, um, industry, I, I think, has really evolved over the last 10 years, primarily because I think what you're seeing here, these Southern California projects, you know, where people are buying um, just beautiful pieces of property, really primarily for the view. 
And, and so there's a handful of companies like Fleetwood and Otima and, and so many other ones that you probably know, Petroska, um, that are focusing on what are called these thin line uh, or frameless door and window systems. And what they're doing is they're pushing these the design details to really minimize the thickness of these frames and sometimes uh, create a detail that embeds them into the structure, like what you're seeing here. So obviously there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of meat behind the frame system that's actually exposed here for shims and waterproofing and, and other different things. Um, but this is one of those great examples that you're kind of pointing out about, you know, the, the, the opportunities I think that we get with, you know, with a lot of these amazing view properties to really push accentuate those views. And there's so many different components and manufacturers right now that are coming on, uh, coming online to really help support and, um, and give us those opportunities to push that agenda. Awesome. Um, let's see if this is. I have, let's talk about your process. Uh, mm. biophilic relationship between house owner and the surrounding natures seems right. like each one of these i bet you if i go back to the table of contents <laughs> has some sort of um powerful idea behind it uh, a reveal a weave a sculpt a delight craft levitate um, right sheets of sand did that come from your business partner is that coming from you is is this is something you've kept throughout yeah it, it's a mutual thing you know it, it, it's part of the philosophy of the firm uh, obviously grants is a, a strong proponent of it and probably our, our greatest advocate for it but it, it's something that he and i share um equally and and really it, it's the idea for us as far as what we do and kind of i believe how we differentiate ourselves from a lot of other architects and landscape architects in our sphere, especially here in Southern California, is that we look at a property or we look at a project from property line to property line, right? Um, and in so in saying that is that we we see, um, we don't really think of designing the house and having a landscape architect design around it, but really finding ways to weave those indoor and outdoor relationships together, almost kind of like this beautiful lifestyle tapestry. There's some areas that are covered, there's some areas that are not, there's some areas that are clearly indoors, some areas are not. But when you're looking at it, it's, it's, it's like, you're, how do you live on the property? Not necessarily, how do you live in the house? And so those particular ideals that you just went through, the, the five or six that we have are, um, different ways to kind of capture that sentiment within the larger context of how we design from property line to property line, which again, I think is one of our, our differentiators. And they give a little meat to how we begin to layer beyond that for each and every project. So that's what you're seeing with a lot of these homes and, and kind of its relationship to biophilia is, is that uh, again, in, in Southern California, we're, we're so blessed with being able to open up our homes to the outdoors. You know, we're not building, I think, like in Denver and Colorado or, you know, a lot of other places where there's a like very clear delineation between well, indoor and outdoors. Minnesota or North Dakota. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, for those, I, I don't even know if they can step outside, right? Yeah. But but there's but there's a le much less of a clear delineation here in Southern California, especially throughout the year. I mean, we have our cold seasons and whatnot as well, um, but there's different opportunities for us to really push on that. And, and that's kind of been the agenda of the firm is to really how do we create a, a, a how have we evolved a design philosophy that really is rooted in Southern California, takes advantage of our amazing climate, takes advantage of these amazing properties that we're often introduced to with you know, clients that are dreaming big and to really open these homes up. And that's been kind of a, you know, the, the driver for a lot of the projects that you see here, you know, uh, understanding that relationship between the house and the site. And then on a very tactile level with these two particular images that you're showing, you know, there's gotta be a human and a scale element to it, right? And, and that's kind of always been the, the argument or the kind of the critique of modern architects, especially here in Los Angeles, is that these homes are often cold white boxes that are on the hill. They're basically museum pieces and how could someone live in these things? But, um, you know, through the years, um, we have found ways to scale that down to where we, we still understand that these homes, although they might be five or 10,000 square feet, um, are still homes and people need to connect to them. There needs to be a sense of scale and a tactile warmth to them, either through the materials that we select that have a natural, you know, earthy hue to them, 
or uh, working collaboratively with an interior designer that understands the nuances of layering and fabric and color so that there's a certain level of personality and softness that comes with each of these homes rather than having these stark white glass boxes um, that are in many ways soulless. So. And that's one of the reasons why I picked this up is because one of the major complaints against concrete, which I think is a beautiful material, is that it's actually an ugly material. Um, but yeah. the picture that we're looking at is a fireplace and what yeah. I would think is a concrete wall with it board is. formed um, and then either a pigment put in or a natural mixed in or – yes. I want to say exactly probably, right. yeah, probably mixed yeah. in, probably not applied at, at the end, correct? Yeah, no, it, it, you're absolutely right. And you've got a great keen eye there. It's a board form wall uh, with a color aggregate mixed in so that it takes the edge off of the industrial gray uh, look that, you know, it, it's kind of young. And and so there, because of that, there's a natural warmth that comes from it. And, and furthermore, you can even see with that particular image, uh, board form is one of our go-tos when we when we do expose concrete because it does bring a sense of scale to it. You know, the the, the pieces are smaller. You you can wrap your head around it. It's not kind of a dumb wall that has no sense of scale. And and if you do it right, and, and with the boards, um, you know, uh, with the wood uh, with the wood boards, there's a there's a beautiful grain element that sometimes gets pulled out of those boards, and people are are shocked to to see that in the concrete, and so that leaves a beautiful natural imprint that again takes the edge off of what could be a very cold and industrial and um, uh, less sophisticated material. So, I also bet that that philosophy and explaining that to clients. Uh, almost self self selects people out of it, um, right? Uh, because if they don't want to basically uh, dive into that holistic vision, then you're probably not the firm for them, right? Yeah, and that's and that's kind of where we are right now. And I, I think you know it, it, we're we're grateful to be there after 30 plus years where we we've developed a a fairly clear point of view about design. Um, although each of our projects is unique, there is a similar thread of um, sensibility and even material logic, board form, probably one of the most uh, most clear of those where our clients come to us because they know we do board form and that's what they want. And, uh, and they and they don't trust the process to render something else that's unique around it. But there's different key elements like you just mentioned that, um, that, we're begin, uh, that we're becoming more iconic to the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, I'm showing a picture of a project uh, titled Sculpt. And one yeah. thing that you mentioned earlier from an interior designer perspective was layering. Uh, this project says layering to me from a architectural perspective. Right. Um, and then mass and void, and you have board form, uh, concrete in front with uh, some landscaping. And then the walls behind it, uh, I don't know if those are concrete or plaster. Those plaster. are plaster walls, yeah. Um, very interesting project here. Yeah, thank um, you. Let's see. Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah. It's, uh, levitate. <laughs> Le I mean, every project is, is beautiful. Um, maybe I'm going too far here. No, I'll go back. Is there anything, maybe I'm not thinking about the right one. Let's, let's keep going. Uh, actually, the one I want to get to, uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can see these images. Here we go, is this project. Right, it's yeah, called, this is a fun one. Yeah, Sand Streets. Can you talk about this one a little bit? Yeah, this was a great, this was a fun project for us. It, it, it's it's definitely aesthetically different. Um, and, and again, this, when I look at this, I, I just think of our amazing clients that we had a chance to work with. Um, essentially, they were a young couple out of South Africa. He's, uh, he was probably in his early mid thirties at, at the point when we engaged on this project with him about 10 years ago. And, and so he had this, his vision for himself and his family to kind of create the modern safari lodge, you know, mm. it, it, that it would echo a lot of the, the elements to the details and you know just the material logic that he and his wife do coming up and growing up back home um but what is the los angeles southern california version of it and, and so it was fun to kind of explore that with him to to kind of uh 
think about how do we do this in an authentic way that didn't feel um, um, like Disneyland, where we're just basically applying, you know, South African materials on them and calling it a day and, and saying that, you know, we checked that box, but how do we integrate in materials and shape them and form them in a way that honors both his, his, um, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his South African roots, as well as the fact that they are now clearly a Southern California American family. And so that's what we're seeing here. Um, you know, we, you, we've, we, we kind of stepped out and, and challenged ourselves a little bit in, in our sensibilities to, to work with uh, a lot of these very raw South African materials. You know, um, the, the material stone, you know, oftentimes we err on the side of doing more honed and finished slabs um, sure. because there's a certain monolithic and look to that. But he really loved the rustic and natural feel of, of having overgrouted stone uh, for the base and also for the entryway. There was something that kind of resonated and echoed and felt familiar to him um, about that. And one of the other things that you see here that's kind of one of the um, the more iconic, unique elements is the reeded lattice in the front. So typically, you know, for most of our modern homes nowadays, we would do that, we, we would often call that scrim. It's a way to kind of create sunshade and privacy, but those are done out of essentially metal louvers nowadays. They're all mechanized and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a certain contemporary feel to them. But we found a ways to use uh, wood latias, which are branches to create that level of screening and, and to give him a South African version uh, of what that meant here in Southern California. And so it's even to have fun with the fact that, listen, these things aren't symmetrical, one's a little lower. There's a very casual, almost beachy feel to, to this home that um, what we love about it is that it just doesn't take itself as seriously as a lot of the other homes that you see on our on our website. And, and that is in large part to, because of our clients. Yeah, I wanna continue on this project, but um, I have a quick question about this because I've seen the branches um, used not only in your projects, but other projects. Yeah. Is, is there a uh, supplier that supplies that? Or is it like, we gotta find some some guys to go out in the forest and <laughs> find some twigs. And... You know, it, it's a little bit of both. So the, the first time we we went down this road, and, and it was actually for a, a kind of a Mexican hacienda project about 15 years ago. Um, and it was more of a very custom, we've got to find that vendor. And, and they actually found a vendor out of um, uh, South America that sourced it. Honestly, it was to a level where I, I don't know exactly who and where, sure. but it, ended up on a boat and it was in Los Angeles, you know, a few months later. Uh, in this particular one, um, our client was extremely um, engaged in part of the process. He considers himself very resourceful. And so, and he had a lot of relationships back in South Africa. And so we were able to source these directly from South Africa. He, it was one of those, I have a friend who knows a friend kind of things uh, that was able to get us this and then, you know, ship it here to uh, to the States um, so that it was just a little more authentic and everything. And, and he felt he, he loved that because he just became part of the process and the, the act of building it. Yeah, extremely authentic then. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then that uh, sort of pattern uh, echoes in the ceiling. Is that yeah. a similar, is that the same material, different material? It is, it is the wow. same material. Yeah, yeah. So we brought that through and, and uh, ordinarily, you know, say the modern version of that would be uh, maybe a, a stained wood tongue and groove ceiling. Um, just because we do like the natural warmth of that on you know, on our on, on our lids, um, but again, here the South African modern version is to bring those latias through and give us kind of a natural texture and a and a casualness with each of these spaces that uh, we otherwise wouldn't be able to achieve. And so this is then culminated on the top that that last image. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, this particular rendering was something that we did early on, and I think there's some final photography in there. But you know, at the very top is this penthouse, and and this is where we uh, became a little bit more literal about it. You know, and it's actually a fun floor that nobody really sees from the outside, based on you you know with the images that you showed before. But the idea is that, that he wanted kind of his penthouse floor where they would do most of their day to day living. We engineered and designed in uh, almost in heroic fashion a pool <laughs> that yep. sits on the third floor level, and uh, essentially it's where they spend most of their time. It includes their living area, their kitchen, um, some of the detailing that you see there, and also their primary suite. Um, and because it's on the upper floor, it it has uh, commanding views of the uh, Pacific Ocean, even though they're a few blocks back from the ocean. So, gotcha. Um, technical question. If you don't know, it's fine. 
how do you mm. attach the, those the twigs to the roof? <laughs> well, they were all had to be fastened. So they're basically hung yep. from the ceiling uh, through. I think they were actually screwed. So that each of the reeds were screwed onto a plywood sheet, and then oh. the plywood sheet was mounted on. So that was the the way that we were able to control individual reeds from warping or kind of falling out of place. So everything's kind of uh, canalized on the ground and placed up. And then the the reeds are, uh, I mean, they're they're decorative. They they have no structural value. The the structural value is is the uh, is the plywood underneath it. That's essentially a backing board that gets drilled onto the underside of the uh, the roof rafters. Yeah, they have an emotional value, um, they aesthetic do. value, yeah. uh, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I th I think we covered a lot, a whirlwind of 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 things. Is there <laughs> any particular project that you want to talk about? Anything we missed? Any kind of important idea um, that maybe you wanted to discuss? Uh, you know, not one in, in, in particular. I mean, they're all so special for different reasons. And I, I think for us, it's, it's because, you know, when we look back at each of these projects, we really see our clients. And this is a perfect example of it. I, you know, we wouldn't have come to this conclusion, this design conclusion with anybody else, even if they were from South Africa. Um, because there's so many sensibilities in here that are just, it's because of them, you know, how they live and how they want to live. Um, even you see that it's like their their bathtub and their primary suite bathroom just is right next to their bed. You know that's not for everybody. The shower is oh, four feet away yeah. from the bed. You can see that where the glass enclosure and the low wall, and, and so there's again a very casual safari large feel to it. And and so uh, so it makes me proud. You know to 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 see each of our clients' individual personalities and agendas come through and. And for us to be able to be part of that and obviously weave it through our DNA um, versus a portfolio of work where you're not quite sure who or if there was a client because, you know, everything looks very cookie cutterish. So, Absolutely. Um, uh, I'll leave you, uh, I'll have you kind of end it up with where can people find your work? Um, where can people get a hold of you if they want to or where or if you don't want them to, you don't have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but basically yeah yeah well we're um so there's a couple different ways to find us as you mentioned earlier we're here in southern california los angeles in particular um and that's kind of been our our playground for 30 plus years but we have been um venturing outside of our backyard here so to speak and, and so we're, we've been privileged to to operate and do work in minnesota and aspen and you know in dc and even overseas and so it's been exciting to be able to kind of extend our brand beyond Southern California and really try to find that relationship of the indoor and outdoor for people in different climates. Um, a lot of work is is on our website, uh, which is kaadesigngroup.com. Um, and the reason why uh, it's it's KAA Design Group versus KA Design, a, a little short history there. A lot of the work that we're looking at here um, is the modern work. And, and that's essentially what uh, it's, it's essentially the work that we do as a firm, but we also have a traditional boutique studio that operates within our K design group firm that's run by our third partner, Eric Evans. And, uh, and so hence the K design group encompasses, it's the large umbrella over that it includes not only the modern work that my partner Grant and I do, but also the more traditional classic work that um, our third partner Eric Evans does as well. So there's a little something for everybody there. Um, our K design group uh, has a, a, is a, is a great kind of first uh, access to be able to look at our work and get a sense of what we do and what we believe in. And we've also have a, a presence on social media. So uh, look us up and on Instagram and Facebook and I'm sure there's other things out there, Pinterest, Tiles as well. So, yeah. Well, Duan, thank you for uh, giving us a look inside your firm. Great. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate the opportunity.